So uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to look on at the appendix to Hebrews page on page 9 in our notes. And this, I believe, is one of the most controversial passages in all of the New Testament. So hopefully we'll be able to get a good understanding of it, as well as confuse you with many different interpretations of it. <laughs> Not really, we don't want to confuse you. But there are a lot of interpretations, so we'll look at them. So let's look at the passage first, and we'll read Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 4 down through verse 7. And I'm going to ask uh, Ellie, could you please read Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 4 through 7? Yes, sir. Can you do a test real quick? Yeah, we're, and we're going to test this out. You have to uh, unmute yourself. You you're, you're muted, Micah. There. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 is echoing. Is that okay? Okay. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word to come, if they shall fall, fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Okay, so of course, now you can mute yourself, Mike. This passage and the difficulty of it, the apparent problem of it would be that one can lose their salvation. And so, of course, we believe the Bible teaches we do not lose our salvation. We are secure in Jesus Christ. So what is the writer saying here? And we'll just say Paul. So on page nine, in our, in our uh, page here, it says, so this passage is one of the most difficult to interpret. Being difficult, there are many interpretations of the text, so it's fitting for us to consider various possibilities and interpretations. So some take this passage to mean that true believers have lost their salvation especially looking at verse 6, he says, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, and coupling that with verse 4, he says it would be impossible for them to, to renew them again to repentance. The problem with taking it this way is what? There are many scriptures that teach our, the security of our salvation. And so we don't want to take one scripture and just try to do what we, what we could say is theological gymnastics with it to kind of reason our way out of it. We want to be honest with the text, but we also have to take all of the scripture into account. When we look at one particular scripture, you have to take all of it into account. So another position is that this is a hypothetical or the writer is saying, if this could happen, which it cannot. Spurgeon himself focuses on this word impossible in verse 4 and takes this position. So good people take these varying positions that we'll even look at. So Spurgeon would say, it's impossible for this to happen. We're persuaded better things for you. But just in case it could happen, they couldn't be renewed again to repentance. But he's saying it's, it's impossible for it to have happened. Wearsby holds this view and says, it is probable that he is describing a hypothetical case to prove his point that a true believer cannot lose his salvation. And he says, verse 9 supports this interpretation, which says, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So do you see the point there? He's saying it's impossible for this to happen. 
And it is impossible in a way for a true believer to lose his salvation, but is that what he's saying here? Okay, a third view is that since the ones spoken of here are Jewish people in the first century, some of whom were strongly considering Christ, but they weren't saved, that this passage applies only to them. That this passage applies only to them. That it relates specifically to those who could return to temple worship. Because remember, that's really the crux of a lot of these, these passages that we were looking at even last week. The warning passages warning them not to go back to the temple worship. And if they did that, they would be rejecting the, the work of Jesus Christ. And in a sense, that this position does have some merit because he says in verse 6, it says, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So if they, if they went back to the temple worship, what he's saying is, they would be, in a sense, putting a stamp of approval on the, the death of Jesus Christ and, in a sense, crucifying, them, crucifying him themselves. And that's like a bridge too far. They could not be restored from that. Okay. The next point, okay, so, so again, let me finish reading that statement. It relates specifically to those who would return to temple worship, but there has been no temple since AD 70, so it cannot apply to anyone today since there is no temple any longer. Kenneth Wiest, and I, I love his commentaries. He's written a number of helpful commentaries. He takes this view. A fourth view is that this passage is addressing true Christians and that the falling away does not refer to salvation, but to a loss of reward, a loss of reward. That's number four. J. Vernon McGee, a great Bible teacher. By the way, have you ever seen pictures of J. Vernon McGee and his church in Los Angeles? It, it doesn't, it's not there any longer, but he had a huge church in downtown Los Angeles he filled up a massive auditorium. And of course, he had a, a nationwide television or, or radio ministry of Through the Bible. And he's a great Bible teacher. But I disagree with him on this, on this point. Because he, he says that it refers to a loss of reward. And he talks about the fruit of salvation and is speaking of the possibility losing their reward. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 3 and John in 2 John verse 8. It's true that a Christian can lose their reward, but is that what he's saying here, that they're just falling away? It doesn't say that they're losing their reward. It says if they shall fall away. A fifth view is that this is a warning given to the danger of a Christian moving from a position of true faith to becoming disqualified for further service and for inheriting millennial glory. In a sort of strange way, the author argues that the person is saved, yet does not lose his salvation when he commits a clear defection from the faith, that is apostasy, withdrawing from their Christian profession. That's confusing to me. <laughs> I, I don't under, really understand how you can say disqualified from further service and inheriting millennial glory, but you're still saved. Uh, so, and again, Bible knowledge commentary is a evangelical commentary. I use it and agree with most of their interpretations, but I disagree with this one <laughs> also. <clears throat> A sixth position is that this passage speaks of a mere professor and not a teacher professor, but a, somebody who has just spoken with their mouth of faith and not a true possessor of faith in Christ. This position points out that in verse 6 of the original language, the Greek, there's really no if. The word 
could well be translated and, and if they shall fall away to renew them again, followed by a participle so that it can read something like this, and having fallen away to renew them again to repentance. So Matthew Henry, the great Bible expositor, C.I. Schofield, and others hold this view. I'll stick with them. <laughs> so let's look at it, why I would take this position. And if you have questions, uh, you can, do you see all the, all the, um, on this, because I only see that number. No, I, but I, no, but I see all oh, their names. Okay, okay. But they so, can write in the chat. If so if know. anyone has a question, let me know. I, I just can't see everyone at one time. That's, that's the problem here, because I have the PowerPoint up. Okay, the context here is Jewish people of the first century. They move from Judaism right to the verge of salvation in Christ. They heard of Christ, and they had just come to the point of really being saved. But they fell short of true salvation. There's a group of those who are the readers to whom he's addressing have, had fallen short, and were returning back from Christ to their old ways. And we know ourselves that people go to church, they hear the word, it looks like they're saved sometimes, or it looks, looks like maybe they're even on the verge of salvation, but they go back into the world. So people can profess to be saved, or they can come close, I'm on page 10 now, to, to turning to Christ in their hearts, but still reject the truth. So the writer has been dealing with various categories of people, in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, he addresses those who were saved but very weak and spiritually immature in need of milk and not meat. In Hebrews 6, in these verses, he deals with, with these who were mere professors of faith in Christ. It should be with these or those. I, there's a misspelling there. I, I put this. He deals with, is it those? Those who were mere professors of faith in Christ. So consider these phrases here. And these phrases are what kind of make this a hard passage to interpret because these phrases make it seem like he's talking about a Christian. Number one is enlightened. He said, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. So they had an intellectual information. They understood the facts of salvation. It was clear to them. But the passage, what's interesting about this passage if, and this is why I say it's not true believers. The writer never uses the words of salvation that we're familiar with. And especially if Paul wrote this, there's no words like salvation, regeneration. They were not, he doesn't say they were justified, they were sanctified, uh, that they had been saved or anything. It doesn't, you know, he doesn't talk, use this terminology that he he's often uses for by grace. Are you saved through faith? So he doesn't say they were saved. He says they were enlightened. So they had some understanding. Then it says they tasted the heavenly gift. They sampled Christ. They tasted. But they didn't trust. This would be like picking up a book to read, sample it and say, nah, I don't like that book and not buying it. Or like if you're looking for, you know, I'm a real picky peach person. I love a nice juicy peach. But sometimes I'll go into the store and I'll just sink my teeth into the peach to see if it's juicy, if it has juice. And if it's dry, I'll buy it. No, I'll buy it. I don't, I don't put it back and I wouldn't put, do that. No, I would buy it. But I, I would, I want to, but then if it's juicy, then, then I'll get 10 of them. If it's not juicy, I'll just, that's the only one. No, I don't, I don't like put it on the floor or anything, but I'll taste it. But if it's not good, I won't purchase it. The rest, I won't purchase more of them. So like the Jews of old who tasted the fruit of the promised land, some turned back from Christ. Remember some of those Jewish people, they, they tasted, they saw the fruit, but they didn't go into the land. They didn't really believe. So like Jews of old, Tasted the fruit, but some turned back from Christ. So Judas Iscariot, I believe this passage could well describe like a Judas. Tasted the heavenly, and he tasted the heavenly gift, didn't he? He tasted it. 
partaker of the Holy Ghost is the next phrase. They were partakers. They were made partakers. So they participated in the work and the word. Partaker, though, is different than a possessor. It makes clear that the Holy Spirit does a work in the heart of the unbeliever and leading them to salvation. So there was... I believe the Holy Spirit works in the hearts even of unsaved people in drawing them, but that doesn't mean they're all going to be saved. Because in themselves, no man will, will um, no man seeketh after God, right? So the Holy Spirit does works in people's lives to convict them, but that doesn't mean that they're, they're saved at that moment. So the Holy Spirit does a work even in unbelievers in bringing them to salvation. His work and conviction must not be taken lightly. So these Hebrews have been convicted by the Spirit to come to Christ and believe in Him. But again, notice no expressions of the work of the Holy Spirit are referenced. They were not regenerated, indwelled, anointed, sealed, or filled. Those are words that relate to a Christian experience who has the Holy Spirit in them. So they were partaker of the Holy Ghost. But they were not indwelled by the Holy Spirit or sealed by the Spirit and those other expressions that relate to a true Christian experience are not used. And lastly, they tasted the good word of God. They heard the word of God. Judas heard Jesus preach. Judas himself did miracles. And so in that sense, he was a partaker of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Judas even did miracles when he was sent out with the other disciples. So they tasted the word of God, the powers of the world to come. They experienced the goodness of God's word, the power of heaven itself, without being saved. So those are the expressions. They were enlightened. They tasted. They were partakers. They tasted the good word of God. And then it says, if they shall, and having fallen away, as we said, that's really the idea of the, the, the tense of the text. And having fallen away. To renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It means to slip aside, fall away, to slip aside, to deviate from the right path, wander away. Renew means to restore something back to its original condition. Now, if this passage is dealing with losing one's salvation, which it isn't, but if it is, it would mean, though, that if you lost your salvation, you couldn't what? Regain it. And Pentecostals who theologically believe, that, like as a part of their theology, Pentecostal doctrine and theology says that you can lose your salvation. But they say you can be saved again and lose it again and get saved again and lose it and get saved. And, you know, so... It's really could be an endless cycle of losing your salvation and regaining it in a Pentecostal kind of a theology. I reject that. And really, the whole, the whole uh, doctrine of losing one's salvation, on what basis would you lose your Let's just say you could lose your salvation. On what basis would you lose it? What sin would you have to commit to lose it? How many times would you have to commit that sin to lose? You know, is it, if you do one sin, do you lose it? No, not one, but five. Well, what, and what's the ground? What would be the scriptural ground for that, making that kind of a judgment? There's, you're really into subjective territory there, just very much opinion. So, so the writer is saying, you had better come to Christ now. If you fall back to your mosaic sacrifices to the works of the law, it will be impossible for you to come back again to the point of repentance. And wandering away from the finished work of Christ on the cross back to the mosaic sacrifices, they would be agreeing to Jesus' crucifixion. And they would be confirming the decision of those who actually crucified Christ. This individual would be declaring that he, was found, that he has found Jesus to be a false Messiah and a deceiver, and that Jesus himself was worthy of that death on the cross. 
So if they came to that conclusion, it would be impossible for them to almost, it sounds almost like an unpardonable sin. It sounds almost like that, like it would be impossible for them to come back, like that they would be have, have hardened themselves so much against God that they could not or would not be saved. Okay, on the next page, just finishing this up, and then if you have questions, you can ask or comments. These Hebrews had perhaps seen Jesus alive, heard and seen the apostles do signs and wonders, had been exposed to incredible blessings. Hebrews 6, verses 7 and 8 speaks of how two people can be exposed to the very same blessings of rain. One will bring forth the fruit of salvation, verse 7, while the other will be cursed, and their end is to be burned. That which, is, that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So this is not dealing with the loss of reward or loss of service, but with the loss of eternal life. Eternal life. The loss of eternal life and the gain of destruction in hell, whose end is to be burned. Verse 9, my take on that would be, but he's saying, we are praying, we are persuaded. It seems like the writer knew these people, and he's saying, we're persuaded that you're not going to go back in that direction. So God challenges us to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, to make our calling, not our ailing, our ailing, <laughs> our calling and election sure. The New Testament indicates that many would enter into the flock of God, appear to be saved, and even teach damnable heresies as well. So those other scriptures. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that teaching on Hebrews 6. Are there any comments about that or any questions at all? Yeah, you can unmute yourself and just holler away. Does that make sense? Did I lose you? It's crickets. Everybody's just staring down at their Hey, Pastor. Yes, Esther. Um, for the different views on what um, those verses mean, so you're saying that six is you. It's usually the most accepted one, right? It's just that those are all different um, interpretations of that, of those verses. I don't, I can't tell you like percentage wise what the most acceptable one is, oh, okay. but I, I do believe when I say others, like I, I know John MacArthur, I have his commentary on Hebrews. And so I don't know what everyone teaches on this, but I did say with credibility, there are good men, good Bible teachers who take a different view on it. So this isn't a passage where we all have to take the same view in order to be uh, theologically sound or, or um, you know, not a heretic. <laughs> so there's good people who take different views. But I'm, I, all I'm saying is that I don't, I, on the other hand, in coming to a difficult passage like this, I don't want to be alone either. <laughs> I, I don't want to be taking a position that, you know, is so novel. I'm the only one in the world who's read this passage and comes up with this view. I, I don't think that, I, that that's the way it should be either because people have been studying this passage for a long time, right? So I, I do believe that I would want to be in a good group of people who, who take a, a view. So I, I, I'm most comfortable with this view. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but I, I can't say the most of people take that view, but it makes them, do you think it makes the most sense? There's so many views. That's why I'm starting to get confused by the sixth one. I got confused. So, yeah, I have to read it a little bit more carefully. But yeah, I, I agree that there you don't lose your salvation for sure. So, right. Yeah. Pastor. Yes, Joni. So on page ten, right, the consideration of the phrases for verses four to six. So Cornelius would fall under number three, right? Partaker 
partakers of the Holy Ghost. So he participated in his work and word, but he wasn't saved. You're saying before Peter yeah. got to him? Mm -hmm. Before P before Peter. Yeah, I mean, Cornelius was a good man and did religious things, but he wasn't saved. That is true. So he's an example of number three. Okay. But the thing is, you know, I, well, that's a, that's a good question, Joni. You know, I'd have to think about that. Because the way I, I look at this passage also, it's almost like a buildup of things. In, in other words, you know, when Peter went to Cornelius, Cornelius had not heard the gospel until Peter really gave it to him. So Cornelius was not enlightened in the gospel. He had not tasted of, the, of Christ or of the heavenly gift. He hadn't heard the gospel in that sense. He, he partook of religious things that, the way I look at Cornelius is he was partaking and doing religious things that a person would do without ever hearing God's word. He was praying, he was giving, you know, giving his alms and, and things like that. But I don't know if he was a partaker in that sense of the Holy Ghost at that point. Why did you, why did you connect Cornelius to that? Um, I was just trying to think of different people um, that I, I was just trying to picture out like what they do, you know, if they're enlightened, tasted. So actually another person came to my mind um, was that he was like, um, when Paul was like um, giving him the gospel and he was like, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, something like that. And okay. so I was just wondering on which of these four categories that person also falls under. Yeah. You, you know, know who could fall under one of these categories is Simon in Acts chapter 8, who was the sorcerer, who it says he believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. And it says Simon, he believed it says he was baptized, and he, then he beheld the miracles and signs, and then he wanted to pay them for the power of the Holy Spirit. He offered them money, and Peter says, your money perish with you. So to me, Simon is an, is an example maybe of someone like this who gives evidence of salvation to the point that he was baptized. So it shows that not everyone who gets baptized is truly saved, you know? And I'm sure I've baptized people like that too. And I'm kind of find comfort that <laughs> some even in the scripture, you know, in the early church um, also went, you know, may had that similar experience. We do the best we can, but humanly, maybe we'll baptize someone who we think is saved. They confess to be saved, but then so I think that's more of an example of this. Or Agrippa, Agrippa, he was enlightened. He heard about Christ. I think Agrippa falls into that category, uh, Joni. Yeah, which category? <laughs> well, at least that he had, he had intellectual information. So he was enlightened. And he had at least some enlightenment. But okay. Simon may have gone beyond that because he was baptized. And he even, he saw the miracles that were being done. So he, he, he tasted and was even a partaker and, a, and had tasted the word of God. So Simon, as well as Judas, kind of, I think, go, goes almost into all of those. But Simon, though, on the other hand, his, the crux of why he left was not to go back to the temple in Judaism either so there was a different thing at play but that maybe you know for one person it could be one reason that makes them want to go back and like for the people in the book of hebrews it was to go back to mosaic worship for somebody else it might be you know they wanted to have the same power of the apostles so you know and and then that gets to the question you know that i even brought up 
uh, could this sin only be committed by people in the first century who were going back, you know, who were being tempted to go back to temple worship. And so with Simon, I think there's a, if, if he meets all these categories, or at least most of them, you could say, well, no, somebody could do this, this, somebody could uh, be in, the, in, in this quality and uh, do this today. Is that all right? Yes, Pastor, thank you. Okay, good yeah. question. At the bottom line, for anyone out there wondering, would it be that once you're saved, you're saved? Do you want to say that? Yeah. But I just want to ask Pastor to clarify. Um, so you believe that if you're truly saved, if you truly have salvation, that you won't lose it? You can't Absolutely. Lose it. That's, that's a, that's a, that's the starting point that salvation is the gift of God. Salvation is the regeneration of the Holy spirit. And once that is done, you are born again and you can't be unborn. You're born into the family of God. You're adopted. And that gives us great security that nothing in Romans eight can separate us from the love of God. John 10, nothing can pluck us out of his hand. And that word pluck, as I brought out before, is that word harpazo, literally harpoon us. So there's a spiritual battle to get us out of the hand of Jesus Christ. There's a spiritual battle. Satan would like for us to lose our salvation, but he cannot take us away from Christ. We are secure in Jesus Christ. That is one that we have all uh, agree, right? Okay. All foundational will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And verse 39 said, this is the will of the Father who sent me. Is she, is she muted? All yeah, un, who has given she can me just me. unmute herself. Wait, hold up, Ellie, so that other people can hear you. Oh, you're not on Zoom. Okay. Oh, Zoom. oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, just, I forgot. Are we just sharing this with you? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but the, the, that way they can hear you. Okay. Uh, there are two verses in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, uh, which talk about surety of our salvation, and that is on verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. And verse 39 said, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Amen. Thank you, Ellie. Are there any other uh, questions about that or comments? I do believe it, it's important for us to have a position of eternal security. Without believing in that as a doctrine, how can we have assurance of salvation? Our salvation is not based on, we were not saved by works, right? It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And we're to do good works, but good works do not keep us saved. Jesus Christ saves us and we are kept, it says in 1 Peter, by the power of God unto salvation. Okay, so let's move on to James. Let's just, the last few moments here, we'll introduce James. If you have your book, your Jensen book, I would like to refer to a couple of passages here in James as well. So in James, the theme for James, and you, you do have to know the themes for each of these books, the theme for James is developing a faith that works. So number one, the authorship, the date, and place of writing. James is the Lord's half-brother. Of course, his father was Joseph. His mother was Mary, but Jesus did not have a, through bi biological birth, a father. So he's the half-brother of Jesus. James had the same mother, not the same father. He became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. So this is James who became really the pastor of the church in Jerusalem once Peter had left it. 
Now, if you look on page 425 in your Jensen book, and uh, let's see, who has that book there? Kerry, do you have the book, uh, the Jensen book? I do, Pastor, online, so it never really matches up with the print version. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, okay. Um, Esther Han, do you have the book there? Do you have the book? Could you please read on page 425, number six, there where it talks about death, the death of James? Sure, um, death. A strong tradition is that James was martyred at Jerusalem in AD 62. This date is about one year after the closing of the book of Acts and about five years before Paul and Peter were martyred. The manner of death, if Josephus AD 37 to 95 and others are correct, was by stoning at the order of Ananias, the, the high priest. Okay, so James is mentioned in the Gospels. He did not believe in Jesus during the earthly life of Christ. But in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, it seems that James believed right after his death and his resurrection. And there's a chart on page 423 in your book as well of his family relationship to Jesus as his brother. Even he confronted Jesus in John chapter 7, but then was converted shortly after his death and resurrection. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and Edgar, could you read that verse, please? Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Yes, sir. Just read. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, can you hear me now? Sure enough. Yes, yep. okay. Ch uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Mm -hmm. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. With his brethren, with his brothers, right there. So James is included in that. And then if you look in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7. Anna, could you read that one for us? 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7. Um, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Okay, so here he separates James from the apostles. So it would seem that he's talking about James, the Lord's brother. Now, there are other James in the New Testament, but I believe it's pretty solid ground that he would reference James because he became a very important leader in the early church. And you put that, you put that in the timeline of who Jesus saw, but just based on that one verse, we don't know anything else about that either. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, James is also mentioned in Galatians chapter two, you know, as a pillar in the church and so forth. So anyway, this is James, the half-brother of the Lord. He became a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Acts 15, Galatians 2.9. He died by martyrdom before Paul and Peter died, somewhere around A.D. 62 in Jerusalem. That's the tradition. So Jensen believes that James, here's letter B now, is the earliest New Testament book written. A.D. 45 to 50. Thiessen also gives an early date stating that the church order and discipline are very simple. The doctrinal character of the book also points in the same direction. So remember, in our, in our theology class, we talked about biblical theology and the theology of each book itself. And so the theology of the book of James is simpler in, in some ways, and biblically accurate, but not as deep in, in a lot of other areas as, let's say, Paul, into the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So many believe that's 
shows James to be an earlier book. The theme of James, we'll say, is that it's a practical book. It shows us the marks of a mature Christian, the marks of a mature Christian. He emphasizes that a true faith works. A right belief leads to right behavior. So when you come to the theme, if you would know that as the theme, not the title, Developing a Faith That Works, know that for your theme for James, you don't have to know both of them. Know marks of a mature Christian. Emphasizing true faith works, a right belief leads to right behavior. Okay? The key verse of James, James 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. James is really about doing. In 108 verses, James uses 54 imperatives. Oh, right behavior. That's the, that's the blank there. And I don't have the blank for the, 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 the last blank on page 11 is imperatives or commands. I don't have it on the screen. Did you get that? Do you have a, is that on the next page? No, it's on the bottom of one. Yeah. In the 108 verses, right? Yeah. Okay. So 54 imperatives. In fact, I have a, I did a message one time in James seven or James chapter four, beginning at about verse seven and down, uh, I can't remember, maybe around verse 11 or so. There's like 10 commands. So I did a message on the 10 commandments of James. So James is full of commands. Pastor. Yeah, and I think we'll stop right there tonight. That's a, that's a stopping point. And yes, and Joni, you have a question. Um, yes, Pastor, you mentioned about um, what are the um, reason again why was James was considered to be the earliest um, book written? Okay, it just gives a, uh, as it says here, a simple church order. For example, I will say this here. If in James chapter 2, verse 2, for example... He says, if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, goodly apparel, and also a poor man of vile raiment. Does anyone know what that word in the original language is, assembly? Synagogue. Yeah, it's synagogue. So that word points to an early, to a early uh, writing. Thank 